Now, Crystal, are you ready to slaughter? Yes. <laughs> Zoe! We needed, we needed more length. Welcome to the Outcast Studios here in San Diego, California. With me is... I'm Crystal Hess over at Hess Systems. And one of my co-workers and, I guess, co-hosts for a lot of the Outcast videos coming up. Yeah. So today we're working on something special. The Microhawk from Outcast Stoneworks. Something that we've been working Ooh. on for a while now and we've perfected into a kit. It is our 2-inch, 20-minute flying platform. And we're building out just the basic setup today, flying FPV, aka first person view, and showing you how to put everything together initially. We're gonna be doing another video on how to configure it, and yet another video on how to make it fly autonomously while adding a GPS. But today we're keeping things simple. Okay, so we're gonna go over the tools that you're going to need for this build process and get you up to speed on what you need to know and how to use it. We have, of course, a pair of tweezers just to help you finagle the wires into place a pair of dikes to cut the wires down to the size that you need, and then you have driver bits to actually screw the screws into the frame. And in case you don't have every one you need, a nice little handy multi-tool like this that has every driver size on it. And then of course we have a solder sucker just to suck the solder out in case you use too much. A soldering flux. This is great to help flow the solder joints, makes everything nice, shiny, and easy. And of course, a soldering iron. This is the TS100, super recommended. It works great, and honestly, it's one of my favorite. And of course, you're also going to need your solder, which we're using uh, 6040 rosin core. And then you're going to need something to clean your soldering tip off of. And that really is all the tools you're going to need for this build process. Now, let us get into the next step. So, what's the next step, Zoe? Well. What's in the box? So we What is in the box? What's in the box? What is in the box? What is in the box? What is in the box? So we have here the Outcast Drillworks Microhawk Kit. And inside you're going to find all the parts you need to build your own Microhawk. We have the 4mm carbon fiber frame with camera mounts, top plate, standoffs, and screws to put together. We have a what looks like to be an ESC or electronic speed controller. This is what controls the motors and their position. We have the flight controller. That is the brain of our little build. And depending on the kit you get, you might have Betaflight and or iNav pre-installed. We have motor screws. Obviously, you're going to need those. And of course, you have a four Outcast Drillworks 1104 7500 kV motors. They are specifically set up for this build to get good efficiency and a lot of power out of something very small. And we've got our Cadex Vitel camera. It's good for daylight and nightlight. And of course, we got some sticky stuff. That's just tape to help you push down the receiver. And we've got some more bolts and motor things. And we have a video transmitter that is 25 to 400 milliwatts that weighs less than a gram. And of course, we got some stickers in the box just in case. So, depending on your build, you may or may not get a receiver, and we'll go over the receiver installation later in the video. All right, what's next, Zoe? So, the next step, once you have everything unboxed, is putting the frame together. So, you're going to need to open up the bag, take the frame out. Again, this is a 4 millimeter micro frame. It's about 130, 130 millimeters in diameter. Mm -hmm. Inside you're going to find a couple camera mounts. Are these camera mounts? Yeah, those are the camera mounts that go around the standoffs. And then you're going to find a little package full of additional parts. And of course you're going to have our bits and bobs to actually assemble the frame. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is attach the uh, screws to the plate and the plate to the standoffs. So at first it doesn't matter what side you put the screw through, but whatever you do, that's going to become the bottom and the standoff will be the top. Alright, we're all tightened. 
So now that you have your standoffs on the frame, you're going to want to attach your camera mounts. So to do this, it's actually fairly simple. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you how to do this because it's a little confusing. So you can either put them on either side, but there's only one right way to do that. So you see they're not completely symmetrical. You're going to put the actual edge on the inside of the frame and just slip them right over the standoff. And then do the other one. So it's fairly simple to actually do. Wow. And so your camera is going to attach to the standoffs, and that's what's going to hold the camera to the frame. Now, the frame build is actually complete at this point. Okay, so now that we have the frame assembled, the next part is attaching the motors to the frame and getting it ready to be assembled to the ESC. Ooh, these are some pretty motors. Yeah, the purple motors, custom made just for Outcast Filmworks. So each motor has a packet of screws that you will need to attach it to the frame. So now that we got our motors together, we have our motor screws. And you're going to want to take the screws out of the bag and get them prepared so you can actually attach the motor directly to the frame. I got all the screws out. What size do you think I, I'll need? So you're going to want the longer of the screws. The short ones you won't need for this build, they're just included in case you want to use the motors with a different frame. So you may want to use Loctite on the screws to help them from falling out, but right now we're just putting them into the motors to kind of get everything mocked up and put together before we finalize all these screw tightnesses. What color Loctite? Blue! Make sure you use blue, that way you can remove it in the future and replace the screw if you need to. Now that we have the motors onto the frame, the next step is attaching the electronic speed controller <laughs> to the rest of the drone. Once the electronic speed controller is attached, we can wire up the motors to this PCB. Okay, so the next step is to open this up, get the standoffs out from it, and attach the standoffs to the main frame. So that is the electronic speed controller. It's a 20 amp BLLAS ESC. That means we have over 80 amps of pure power that can be put through this machine on two cell. So before we attach it to the rest of the frame, we need to add our standoffs to the frame. So using the screws that are currently included. And also we're going to open up the flight controller packaging so it has extra standoffs and parts that we're going to need to assemble our stack. So those are the wiring harnesses that we'll use to attach the flight controller to the ESC. There's absolutely no wiring needed from the flight controller to the ESC, so it makes things simple. And so the first thing you want, want to do is you're going to want to grab these, the essentially the nuts. You're going to want to grab the nuts, and you're going to want to put this in like this. So you're going to take this from the top, pop it through the hole, and put the nut on this side. Okay. There's a couple ways you could build it. This is honestly the best way. Uh, the screws that are included in the kit are a little bit short, and on a big, on a good crash, if you don't do it this way, it could kind of come apart. So you're going to want to put them in this style. Um, that's why I opened up both packages, just to make things a little bit easier. All right, I have all four standoffs in. This is for the flight controller. Yeah, so this, the standoffs right now are for the ESC. You're going to put the ESC on top of these standoffs. What's an ESC? The ESC is the electronic speed controller. The ESC controls the motors and tells the motors what direction slash speed they should be spinning at any point in time. Is that the flight controller? No. The flight controller actually controls the ESC. So okay. the flight controller is like, says, okay, motors, you need to be at 1400 on the thrall range. The ESC's job is to take that information and take the pure power out of the battery, control three phases on the motor wires in concert to actually get to spin the speed that needs to go. AKA magic. So now that we have the standoffs in, the next step is to put the ESC on top and then the other standoffs into that. What does it matter? Actually, yes, it does. So. The ESC has uh, two pads on the back. These pads are for your um, power leads. So we're going to attach the ESC like so and put the standoffs in here like that. Now you may... Uh, you have it facing away from the cam um, yes. camera mount. <coughs> that way the and power lead will come out through the back. With the plug on the bottom. Yep. So there's one little trick to these two. 
Um, we found that you want to cut the tip of this with a dike to shorten up the length of this so it'll fit better into the standoff. How much would you cut off? Uh, just the tip. A little bit more than that. Yep, yeah, that's good. You only needed to cut off like a couple millimeters. Yeah, that's good. Right on. So it doesn't take much to actually get the length that you need, but it's very helpful to have the length. And that should screw all the way down. And if it doesn't screw all the way down, you may need to cut a little bit more off the standoff to make it fit. Now that we have the ESC attached to the frame, we can start attaching the motor wires to the ESC and attaching our XT30 connector to the ESC itself. Now this is where things get fun because this is where most slash almost all of your soldering is going to take place on the actual drone itself. So the first thing we're going to want to do is tin, quote unquote tinning, is the process of applying solder to the pads before you actually attach the wire. So you're going to make sure you're going to want a soldering iron for this. We have the TS100 set to 380 degrees Celsius. Where can you buy these? Uh, they're pretty much available everywhere on the internet. Rotorite has some. We might stock them, but this is pretty much a standard tool that you're going to want we for your kit. Them. So you're going to want a soldering iron. This is a TS100. You can get these all over the internet. There's nothing too special about it. You may have a regular soldering station, a weller, whatever you have, just make sure you have a fairly fine tip like the one attached to this. Now, Crystal, are you ready to solder? Yes. So we're gonna wanna use flux to actually tin the pads. This will help the solder flow into all the little holes around the OC. If you look really closely, you'll see these tiny itty bitty itty bitty holes inside the flight controller and ESC on the pads. Those holes allow the solder to flow deeper into the ESC to create a better electrical connection. Cool, so now that we have the flux on the pads, we then want to take our solder and actually start applying a solder to all of the pads. So you're going to want to take the pad. I like soldering. I, like, I really like soldering. Yeah, I can tell because your brain. Don't breathe this. I'm going to hold the soldering iron on the pad itself. Distribute the heat. So hold the uh, iron all the way down to the pad. There you go. Like that. It takes a little bit to learn a proper soldering technique. A lot of people want to apply the soldering iron to the solder and try to get it to flow onto the pad. Realistically, you're going to want to actually attach the soldering iron to the pad directly and then push the solder onto the pad and soldering iron tip. Crystal's already getting better. Look at this, almost a pro on her fifth joint. Now the reason you put solder on the pads directly versus attaching the wire to the pad and then putting solder on one connection, this is allows you to put essentially the solder on the pad and then when you attach the wire, you're just heating up the solder that's on the wire and the pad and melting the two together so you don't have to play with this extra bit of uh, solder. Makes things a lot easier to pretend. Soldering is 90% prep and 10% actual putting things together. So that is the pre-tinning process. Now you're going to want to take these motor wires. Now there are a couple ways you could do them. You could either go directly to the sides like this and cut them down, or how I prefer is to take the wires, wrap them around the inner standoff, and actually solder them from the side. So the reason you do this is that it kind of helps you not snag the wires on the ESC. Oh, okay. Wrap it around, solder it, then grab another one and wrap it around, solder it. So really doesn't matter the direction, I just generally start with the first one on the inside to the inside middle to middle and end to end. And you're going to want to make sure you have three pads. So each three pads is for one motor. Now it's important to know that when you're soldering this together, three pads on the outsides of the ESC, one, two, three, one, two, three, equal one motor. Now this is for the faces of the motor. There, this is getting kind of complicated, but this does actually matter because you can't just attach the wires to any of the pads and hope that's going to work. Each motor has a set of pads closest to it. Those three pads are for that one specific motor. 
Now, the why you need three wires per motor is actually kind of complicated, but it deals with the way that the motor works, and it's actually kind of cool. So inside the motor, you have 12 little inductor coils. You have four coils per wire. Now, the way the motor works is it actually applies power in specific order to each set of the coils to get the outside of the motor to turn. The outside of the motor has a set of magnets, so when you in use an induction on the magnets, you can actually get the motor to turn towards the inducted coils. And you do that about uh, 20,000 times a second, and you can get a nice pattern that will get the motor to spin at the speed that you want. Now, it's probably not the best explanation of the way a motor works, but that's pretty much the gist of it. And everything that you need to know for right now is just attach the three closest pads to the closest motor to make sure everything works. Now, soldering takes some time and skill to get used to, but once you start getting the technique down, it's not too difficult. Take your time, recheck your connections, and make sure you're not overflowing into the connections around the soldering. So you're going to want to make sure you take your time with this part of the process. Um, the faster you go, the more mistakes you're likely to make. And realistically, you want to make sure that you don't screw up the soldering portion of this build. Because if you get the connections wrong, you will catch fire. Or burn yourself. Cool! Now that we have the ESC soldered to the motors, that is a large part of the soldering process. This is essentially half the connections that you're going to be doing this entire build video. <gasps> what is that? It's a bird! It's a plane! <laughs> it's ruining all my screws! <laughs> so now that you have it zip tied together, you're going to use your dikes to cut off the extra length of the zip tie. Ah. Now you're going to want to make sure the wires don't get pinched between the side of the frame and essentially the zip tie because you can actually cut these wires if you're not careful. It's rare, but it does happen. So now we have a very clean setup. You have the wires being snaked in on the inside. So when you crash, you don't have to worry about wires getting all messed up, and that makes it way more durable. The next step is going to be attaching our XT30 connector to the back two pads. Now. Something important to note, you have a plus and minus next to each of these pads. Plus is for red, aka the positive, and black is for minus, aka the negative. Now, make sure you do not mess this part up, because if you plug them in backwards, you will get sparks and it will be very mad at you. So this is a complicated connection. It can take a little bit of time and patience. Because it's a bigger pad and a thicker wire, it's going to take more heat to get the solder to flow. Okay, there we go. Did I do it? Are they touching? No. That's good. Go, Zoe. So, now that we have the ESC wiring done, the next step is to attach the flight controller using this little ribbon cable to the ESC and attach the flight controller to the rest of the frame. This part's pretty easy, and it's kind of nice. This flight controller has no direct soldering, so meaning we can use little plugs to actually attach everything to it. Now that we have the ribbon cable attached to the ESC and we have our XT60 connector coming out, we're going to attach the flight controller to the top of the ESC on the standoffs. So there is a front and back to this. It's actually kind of important. So there's a little arrow. There's a little arrow in the middle of the flight controller. That's going to designate forward. So you're going to have that forward. Towards the camera? Towards the camera. And then this little connector in the back is where we're going to plug in the ESC. You can use these little rubber uh, gaskets to absorb some of the vibration. Put it on the bottom? Uh, the I just do the top. It's really hard to get them on the bottom with this light controller. That's a joke. I don't want to think about joke. that. Okay! So all the wires are kind of loose like that. You're actually going to want to twist them up, like so. And just like a Glade plug-in, plug it in, plug it in. Okay, now that we have it plugged in, we have our connection to the flight control ESCs. This is called your stack. Now the stack within a drone is essentially just your flight control and ESC setup. So we have our flight controller connected to the ESCs via this cable. The ESCs connect to the motors with their own connections. And then we power it via this connector which powers everything up simultaneously. So the next step is to attach and set up our 
camera and VTX. Now this part's a little bit tricky because they're very small pads. So I'm gonna actually do this to save ourselves a little bit of hassle and to show you how Professional does very small soldering. So once we open up the package, we're gonna have an antenna and the little wires that you're gonna need for this assembly process. We're gonna want to tin and solder the four little pads on the VTX. Now, it's kind of a complicated process and they're very, very tiny, so you're gonna to wanna to take your time, use a lot of flux, and get these done correctly. And first, we're going to use some flux before we start soldering this connection. So they're so the tiny. Dynamite. So now we are going to open up the camera now that we have our VTX pre-tinned. This is again a Cadex Mattel. It's one of my favorite cameras. It works great at night and it's going to allow us to fly day or night anytime. It's 1200 TVL, so even though it's going to be an analog uh, signal, it's going to look almost like it's high definition. So now that we have the camera unboxed, we are going to take out the wires this is one of the secondary and most complicated parts of the whole process because we're going to be attaching the camera to the VT or the VTX to the camera on the back and then wiring up the camera to the VTX and then the VTX to the flight controller 5 volt pins. Wait. So a camera includes screws and a little tool so you can actually attach the camera to the frame in case you don't have it. Very handy to have. We're going to put this to the side until we're ready to attach the camera. And we're going to take the camera and the VTX and actually wire up the VTX and then attach it to the camera with a little bit of the two-sided sticky tape that's included in the package. So the first thing we're going to do is take the camera wire, little three-pinner, and we're going to put it into the camera. And then we're going to measure out the length we need. And then we're going to actually take our dikes, cut the wire, and once we have the wire cut, we're going to strip the ends of the wires. Get these down to size. I generally use my fingernails, but I just had my nails done, and it makes it kind of hard to actually get the silicone coating off. I'm just going to twist the ends of the wires a little bit. And then we're going to tin up the ends of the wires. So now I, I have these a little bit longer than they need to be. When we're going to tin them up and actually cut them down a little bit so we get rid of the excess amount of wire. We're going to take our trusty soldering iron and attach a little bit of the flux. Help everything flow smoothly. And just like that, we're going to get the wires tinned. It's a very simple process, and this makes everything easier when we do attach it to the VTX. Trim off the tips of the uh, wires. You don't need to do this, but this is going to give you a better connection in the end, and less chance of it breaking off after you crash it, slash bash it around a little bit. Now we need to actually attach it to the VTX. We're going to be uh, attaching it to both sides of the VTX. On this side, we're attaching the camera. On the other side, the power leads going to the flight controller. So we're going to take our positive, and this is for viable power. And generally, positive is on the outside, but on this VTX, it's reversed. Boom, like that. And again, these connections are very, very small, so you're going to want to take your time and verify they're not touching each other because you will have problems making this all work. Uh, generally the VTX and the camera are pretty resilient to um, connection issues so you probably won't catch something on fire but you may not get video out of your VTX. I'm being very careful on these connections because I want to make sure we don't screw this part up. These are smaller than most pads are on most drones. And when you work with a micro like this, you're going to have very small pads. So now that we have the uh, camera connected to the VTX, we're going to curl these wires up. I'm going to take the double sided sticky tape, attach it to the back of the camera. It's nice and flat. And then from there, we're going to remove the other side of the double sided sticky tape. If I can actually get that, let me use the tweezers here. Cool. And then that's off. Now, 
the back of the VTX, I didn't cover this before, is a side that doesn't have this little round connector on it. Now that connector is for the VTX antenna, and the back of it has no connector. So make sure you put that facing out. And then we're going to route this like so. And that way we have the wire snaking down and around to the back. And now we have a camera VTX combo. I like doing it this way because all the wiring is nice and clean. And then we only have two wires coming off the VTX to the flight controller versus a bunch of other wiring going elsewhere that we don't want. So from there, we're going to take the two little wires here. Um, this is your ground and positive wire. And we're going to attach it to the back pads that will now go to the flight controller. Now this can be a little bit frustrating if you're new to soldering because um, again these are very small pads and we're dealing with very tight spaces. Okay, that's one down. I'm holding it with one hand. This is some this is called a pro level gamer move. And see this is actually something that just happened. When I was soldering one pad, the back pad actually came off because I applied too much heat to the pad. If that happens, we're just going to pop it back onto the other side and hit it with a soldering iron very quickly. The longer you put it on there, the more chance you have of the other side coming undone. And that's a very common issue and it's very easy to avoid. So now that we have the two wires on, we're going to remount the VTX. So now that we have the power and ground on the camera, we're going to attach a signal lead to this other pin right next to ground, which will allow us to go from the VTX to the flight controller to control the VTX's power and signal. This is great because we don't have a button on the VTX to actually control it, like a lot of VTXs because it's so small. So we're gonna take this other connector, take the screen wire, I'm gonna cut it. And then we're going to strip the ends and prep it. It doesn't have to be the screen wire, but this one's long enough. Now this part is kind of frustrating because we're going to have to take apart the flight controller and flip the flight controller to actually get this wire to where it needs to go. And the reason we're doing this is that when you build this thing for the autonomous aspect, it has to share a serial port with the rest of the uh, peripherals. So, it's only going to take a second though, and it's going to be worth the, the hassle. I'm going to go to our VTX. And the wire is now on. Okay, now we're going to pop off the flight controller real quick, so we can get to the other side to the connection that we need. Now you don't have to do this part, like you can buy this on 25 milliwatts. Now, 25 milliwatts is FCC legal, so if you do this, it allows you to change channels to ham operating uh, power. So if you don't have a ham license, I highly recommend not to do this part. Oh wow, that just popped off like that, that's weird. I'm going to flip it. I'm just going to take one screw and put it in. And while this is destabilized, makes everything easier to work on. Now on the back here, we have four pads. We have TX3, RX3, TX1, and RX1. Now RX1 and TX1 are going to be for our um, receiver. The receiver, though, has a secondary pin that we can plug in from the side. So we're going to use TX3 right here for the green wire. Now this will, allow us, this will allow the flight controller to send a signal from the flight controller to our little camera backpack to change the channel from, you know, whatever channel you want to whatever power you want up to 400 milliwatts. And just like that, we have now connected the TX to the camera's RX for smart audio. Now I call it Smart Audio because it actually uses the audio pin on the VTX to send a digitized signal from the flight controller to actually interpret it onto the VTX to change the settings. It's kind of like a curmudgeon fix, but it works and that's what people have been using for years now in the hobby. I'm going to make sure that we run this 
clean cable underneath. It gives us a nice clean build. And all the cables will be coming through the same spot. Cool. So now we have the flight controller back attached. We have the wire running underneath the flight controller. So we have the flight controller going to the VTX. The wire is flying to the TX3 pad on the uh, flight controller. Now we're going to attach the camera to the frame. And that's where this extra bit of stuff comes in. And this little tool. Yeah, actually, we're going to move these mounts up a little bit, make it easier to work on. Where you put the mounts is pretty variable. There's no right or wrong spot, really. Just whatever is easiest to work with. And actually, I think we actually have our own tool. Yes, we're going to use this instead. Actually, we need to flip this. Putting the camera on upside down. Which is no bueno. Okay. And make sure we feed these wires out the back. So you have the wires coming back. The caddx thing up this with the connectors at the top. And then we're going to attach just like so. Now, there's not a lot of protection for the camera with these mounts, but because the drone's so small, there's not a lot enough force to generally break the camera and even the worst crash. We have yet to have any damage to our cameras in all the testing we've done in the last six months. Once we're attached, we're going to have the negative to the ground here and the positive to the positive. So on this one, we have negative on the outside and positive on the inside. On the flight controller, you can see ground and 5 volt as corresponding pins and pads. And just like that, our camera module is now hooked up to the rest of our drone. So now when we plug in a battery here, it's going to power the ESCs, which will power the flight controller, and the flight controller will power the VTX, which will power the camera. The reason we wire everything like this is so we have common ground. Generally, if you have the camera and the VTX wired up to independent locations on the flight controller, you can get lines and interference in your video. This should give you the cleanest video possible on your build. So that concludes the attachment of the camera and VTX to the flight controller. Right on! So now that we have finished off the VTX and camera attached to the rest of our build, we are going to take our receiver. Now this is an R9M Mini and this allows us to do long range with this. It runs on 900 megahertz. The kit you get may include a 2.4 gigahertz control receiver. It'll be ex almost identical in wiring. Just make sure you wire up the <coughs> voltage 5 volts, the ground, and the SBUS pad to the wiring harness that we're going to do today. It's very similar and should be about the same on any of the flight controllers and receivers that you use. Okay, so we're going to open up the package here. Now again, your package may be a little bit different, but this one is the way it is. Be careful not to cut the antenna. Now generally, build videos don't include the receiver, and every receiver is different. You might have a Tranus, you might have an X-Lite, you may have Spectrum. Every transmitter has a different type of receiver, and ours uses this. This is my preferred one. 900 megahertz gets you long distance range, and honestly, if you do this right and use the right receiver equipment with this build, you can get a couple miles of distance without having any problems. So in the flight controller package, you're going to get this ribbon cable. This ribbon cable can plug into either of these. You're going to plug it into the one closest to the front, and you're going to use this for your receiver. You're only going to need three of these four cables. You're going to want ground, power, and the green, which is your SBUS slash signal wire. So we're actually going to get rid of this other wire and we're going to strip the ends. Because we might use the other side of it, we're actually going to cut this in half, so we might be able to use this other side for later on in the iNav build video. And you have two options. You can just cut it, or you can de-pin it by using a razor blade to pop up the pin to get rid of it. But the easiest option, and unfortunately not the cleanest option, is to just nip it. 
And just like that, we have the three wires that we need. Now we're going to strip them. So we stripped our wires. Now we're going to pre-tin everything. We're going to pre-tin the pads on this, and we're going to pre-tin the wires themselves. I'm going to read the instructions. Your receiver should come with its own set of instructions, which will tell you the wiring diagram that you're going to need. Hence this. We have ground voltage and S-bus out. S-bus out is on the very outside of the pad. And it's also handily marked on the actual pads themselves. You see a ground, a negative, and a signal pad. So we're going to turn this up, use some flux, a handy dandy flux. Just like squishing it in there. So now we have our wiring harness and our uh, receiver all pre-tinned and now we're just going to start attaching wires. Okay, so we have our S-Bus port, ground and positive. And just like our other connections, you don't have to twist them, but twisting them kind of helps everything stay looking neat and tidy and good. I'm just going to plug her on in, plug it in, plug it in. We still have to figure out a place to put the receiver. Generally, you have a little piece of heat shrink that you can put on the receiver, but it's hard to do that once you have it plugged in. So you're just going to unplug it. So I know we didn't have this in the tools, but like you don't have to put the heat shrink on. Generally what I do is just use the double-sided sticky tape directly to the um, carbon fiber. The double-sided sticky tape acts as an insulator, so you don't have to worry about shorting out in the carbon fiber. So you could do it this way, or the way I prefer, doing it straight to the sti double-sided sticky tape. And so we're going to double up this double-sided sticky tape, add a little extra insulation. I'm going to cut this down to the size that we need. Now on this we have the back side and the top. The top has a little itty bitty button, itty itty bitty button, that is your bind button. You're going to want to make that easily accessible because when you actually connect your receiver to your transmitter, you're going to have to push that button while you plug in a battery. So on that, we're going to put it towards the back here. I'm going to lift up these cables, kind of snake the receiver right on in, and just like that. Our receiver has a new home. And bam! That is that. Now, you're probably going to want to take the zip tie off. So you're going to actually want to take the zip ties. So I use three zip ties. And this is a little bit of a, I would say, complicated technique. But first one is going to take one zip tie. This is just going to be for around the motor wires and the wire going to the receiver. And we're just going to sink that down. So what I'm trying to do is get the receiver wire underneath and run it back. Underneath the frame? Yeah, we're putting the receiver underneath the frame. So it's going to be like that. All this extra wire is going to be hidden up inside of the frame itself. This is a receiver meant for a much larger quad to go a long distance. But today we're putting on this micro so we can go long distance. So now that we have that uh, tied down, next is the crisscross for the actual antenna end. I'm just going to loosely put on one zip tie like that. And again, very loosely. You don't want to tighten it up until you get to the next part. And then you're going to go with both of them, hold them both down, and little by little tighten up each zip tie until you have a nice symmetrical connection. That looks pretty good. So now we have our antenna, which is now attached to the frame. It's not wiggling around too much. Some people don't like having the antenna out like this. They'll mount it to the back of the frame with some zip ties. Um, a lot of people don't even use this receiver. They use something that just has one antenna that you can just go out the side or underneath the uh, motor without having to do this. but. This is what we've been using in-house, and quite honestly, I like having the ability to go long range if we want to go long range. So now, the fun part. You put the top plate on the drone and configure it. Oh my god, Zoe! What? You're amazing balls. Yay! So we have everything wired up. This is pretty much the completed build. 
uh, on the next video we're going to configure it. But the last thing we have to do is put the uh, top plate onto the rest of the frame and that will complete the actual build. So let's do that real quick just to show you how it's done even though it's very simple just in case you're wondering how to do it. So just putting the same bolts we used on the bottom of the standoffs to the top. Now the top plate helps protect your electronics in case you crash. So if you land from the top or if you land on the top of the drone, you're not going to have to worry about um, breaking anything. The top plate is two millimeters thick, so it's, it's fairly rigid and strong. Now on the iNav build, instead of using the top plate, you're going to use a Raspberry Pi Zero. And the Pi Zero is actually pretty durable, like we have yet to kill one in all of our testing. Um, and that will replace the top plate and then from there we're going to attach a GPS onto the top of the Raspberry Pi Zero for a full iNav and a Thomas build. Um, this is just the acro version. I know a lot of people out there just want a long duration micro they can fly anywhere. The new FA rules and regulations mean under sub 250 drone like this you don't have to register it and you don't have to be subjected to the same rules and regulations a much bigger drone does. So for a lot of people out there, this is going to be your build. Um, if you're looking for autonomous, stay tuned for our next video after we configure it to show you how to actually convert this into a completely autonomous platform. Cool! So that is the completed build. On the next video, we're going to configure the drone and fly it and show you the very basics of how to set it up. Because <laughs> we still have to verify that the flight controller is configured, that's getting signal, and verify the motor direction. This is just the physical build of the drone itself. We're pretty much done! That is a lot of stuff to do. If you're just new to the hobby and you've never built a drone before, it can be kind of intimidating. Especially when you're building something so small and kind of hard to work with. When you're working with a 5 inch or a much larger drone, they're a lot easier to work with. They're not so small and delicate. Everything's spaced out more. But this one's pretty tight. So yeah, what do you think, Crystal? This is... SICK! <laughs> wow, Zoe! You did a really good job. This is a really pretty drone. It's small with new FFA rules. Anybody can fly. Yep. And with this setup, it basically you have to fly. When you use the autonomous aspect, it can fly itself and has some extra safety features that makes it easier for a newbie to fly. So if you're looking to get into drones, I kind of recommend you stay tuned for the next video on how to actually install the GPS module and add the autonomous aspect. But for now, if you're just looking to bash and learn how to traditionally fly an FPV drone, this is going to be your best solution. Right on! So that is the build of the Microhawk. If you are a new pilot and just getting into it, hopefully this video has helped you. If you're, it really helped me. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, this I learned is a lot. the first drone you've actually really built. But, uh, I mean, this is the thing. When you're building something like this, it's kind of intimidating. This video is really designed to kind of break down the process that is involved in building a drone like this and give you a visual guide. If there's any part that doesn't make sense, you can leave a comment down below. You can contact us through the website or hit us up on the Facebook community page for Outcast Works in the links below. Outcast Works. And remember to like and subscribe the video if you found this helpful, which I hope you did since you're still here. Yeah, subscribe party. below! Hit that like button! Hit the bell icon! Bing! Boom! And uh, until next time, I've been Z to the O to the E, and stay tuned for the next video on how to configure this machine and get it fun. And I'm Crystal. Bye! <coughs> okay, no. Thanks for watching! Bye bye. It wasn't So now that we have. It's only going to I'm ready to go. Oh, oh, <laughs> from the top. Oh, God. <laughs> Remember kids, don't play with slotting irons because you might burn yourself. If it smells, it smells like, like chicken. <laughs> it does smell like chicken. If it smells like chicken, you're doing it wrong. I